further into um, the webinar. So I just want to say happy Valentine's Day. Thank you for spending your special day with us. I'm Shannon Clifford, and I'm the executive director of the Mesa Verde Foundation. As you know, we at the Mesa Verde Foundation love Mesa Verde National Park, and we love the opportunity to share it with you. We also love you, our supporters, and we want to thank you all for all that you do to make our work possible. Among our beloved supporters is Monica Buckle, who serves on our board of directors and is a volunteer moderator for all of our webinars in our webinar series. Monica will be guiding us through today's webinar. Welcome, Monica. Well, thank you, Shannon, and welcome everyone and a very happy Valentine's Day to you and uh, your nearest and dearest. Last September, our host for today, Paul Mori, Chief of Natural Resources at Mesa Verde National Park was scheduled to present. And Paul, who always takes the call to action, was actually out fighting a wildfire in Oregon State. Today, we are fortunate to have Paul present, and luckily, no wildfires this time of year. Paul's talk, Feral Horses and Cattle in Mesa Verde National Park, their past, present, and plans for their removal. In this presentation, Paul will discuss the ongoing efforts by park staff and partners to remove feral horses and feral cattle from the park after over 100 years of their presence. The talk will describe why horses and cattle are in the park, why they cannot remain and must be removed, as well as some of the restoration efforts needed to mitigate the impact on natural and cultural resources that this livestock has caused the last 100 years. The park has 65 to 80 horses, but does not have any legal authority to allow livestock use, dubbed trespass horses in park studies. They compete with elk for limited water resource and impact cultural sites. The Mesa Verde Foundation diligently works to support Mesa Verde National Park in its conservation, preservation, education, and maintenance needs. We can only accomplish this with your support. If you'd like to make a tax-deductible donation, please visit our website. With utmost gratitude, I would like to thank the Park Superintendent, Casey Cook Collins, for her invaluable support. Now, circling back to our guest speaker, Paul Mori is the Chief of Natural Resources at the park. He has 25 years of experience working as a wildlife biologist and a resource manager for five federal conservation wildlife agencies, National Park Service, Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Forest Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and APHIS Wildlife Services. He has spent most of his career as a wildlife biologist working with projects and species, including the Mexican Wolf Recovery Project, wild horses, coyotes, skunks, raccoons, fishers, songbirds, and raptors throughout the Western and Midwestern United States. At Mesa Verde, he supervises the wildlife, vegetation, and physical sciences programs. This presentation will actually take questions throughout Paul's talk, so please feel free to drop a question in the chat box during the webinar. I would like to now welcome Paul. Thanks, Monica. Let me share my screen. Sure. Okay, can you all see that okay? Yes, it looks great. Awesome, whoops, let me go back up. Perfect. Um, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to move my my video off to the side so I can actually see my screen. So, well, well thanks, Monica and uh, and Shannon. I really, I really appreciate the the, you know, the introduction and and helping uh, um, organize this uh, this talk. Um, it's a uh, it's an important um, topic for the for the park, as uh, hopefully I will I will convince you. <laughs> um, it's it's been kind of a um, a, a project that uh, I've been involved in and. and, and um, in one form or another for, for about 13, 13 years. So, um, so yeah, let me get into the, uh, the talk. Um, 
the, uh, the, the title is uh, Feral Horses and Cattle in Mesa Verde National Park, Their History Impacts and Plans for the Removal. Um, if, if you're not familiar with the project, um, the title might be a little bit of a spoiler for you. Um, we, um, last year, we, we started to remove the horses um, and, and we will continue to do that for the next several, several years. And I'll go into detail um, a, a little bit more um, on, those, on that plan. Um, so when I re refer to livestock in, in, in the presentation, um, it, it, it will be in reference to both horses and cattle, um, but I will be spending a lot of the time um, talking about um, horses um, because um, it's a little bit more controversial. Um, they're a little bit more um, uh, ubiquitous in the park, and they're also having uh, um, more impacts in the, in the park, as hopefully I will demonstrate. So just to give you a, a little bit of a roadmap, can you all see that? Cause I, I've got the, I have the Zoom menus kind of on my screen. I wanna make sure that you all don't see that. No, it looks great on our end, Paul. Awesome. All so right. good. So, okay. Just to let you know where, where I'm going with this, uh, this talk, um, I'll talk about uh, uh, why do we have livestock um, in, the, in the park? Uh, I'll give you a little bit of, history um, about um, how, they, how they got here. Also talk about um, you know, why you as the public and stakeholders um, in a national park um, should, should care about um, you know, why there's livestock in the, in the park. Um, and I'll also hopefully answer the question, you know, you know can or um, can livestock not stay um, in the park? Um, and then, uh, Finally, I'll talk about um, what the Park Service is, is doing about livestock in the park. So why, why is there livestock in the park? Um, so I, I think a, a lot of you all know the, um, I guess the, the, the Anglo origin story of, uh, of, of Mesa Verde. Um, there were a couple of cowboys um, in Macus Valley that were, were chasing cattle. Um, uh, just outside of Cliff Palace, and they and they um, uh, found uh, Cliff Palace. They were the first white settlers to uh, reportedly found Cliff Palace in the in the park. Um, but it's, uh, it's it's actually a little more complicated than than that. Um, actually, in 1888, Richard Wetherill and his brother-in-law uh, Charlie Mason um, were the or, were supposedly the first ones to to. to set eyes on Cliff Palace. Um, but uh, ironically, in 1877, the, the Moorfield family homesteaded the Macus Valley um, and started running cattle um, in the park. Uh, and in fact, uh, in 1881, uh, the Moorfields um, built a cabin in what is known as the uh, Moorfield Canyon now. Um, and that was followed by the, uh, the Praters, Waters, and the uh, Whites um, families. Um, and, and all these names, um, are, uh, are actually canyons in the uh, east side of the park. And then by 1900, um, it was estimated that over 2,000 cattle were, were using parts of uh, Mesa Verde for, for grazing. Uh, some of these cattle were just trailed through the area, um, but uh, a lot of them were um, actually being grazed inside the, inside the park. So that's, uh, that gives um, maybe a little bit of an origin of Maybe some of the cattle that are in the park. Um, I would imagine that uh, you know some of the uh, the ranching operations had some horses that may have gotten loose um, and became feral inside the park. Um, but as far as sources of uh, horses in around Mesa Verde, um, Spanish explorers came through this this area, um, specifically the Dominguez Escalante. Uh, um, uh, expedition came through here um, in, the, in the 1700s. Um, they likely um, did some horse trading with the, uh, the, the Native Americans. Um, maybe some of the horses were lost um, and perhaps some of the horses were, were, were stolen. Um, and then we, we do know through oral history that um, the youths used to summer their horses up on the Mesa, um, likely in the summertime when there was a lot, uh, a lot of green grass up on the, on the green table um, versus down in some of the, the drier areas. <clears throat> also, we know that uh, in, in 1900, there was a widow um, in the town of McPhee near uh, Dolores 
that um, had had some thoroughbred racehorses. Um, and these were horses that uh, were actually trained for um, for races and a lot of them are sold to racetracks back back east. Um, she decided she didn't want to raise these anymore. So she had about 50 of them um, brought to the, the head of Mancus Canyon just outside the park. And uh, they, they were released. Um, I'm sure some of them were, were rounded up and capped, um, but some of these um, may have found their way into the, into the park. Uh, and also in 1910, there was a local horse trader um, outside the park that was, that was known to um, take some of their horses and um, graze them up on Big Mesa, which is on the east side of the park. Some of the uh, additional sources of horses in and around uh, Mesa, uh, Mesa Verde National Park. Um, in the 1930s and 40s, uh, there were uh, seasonal Navajo workers and their families that, that came into the park. Uh, they would come into the park in the springtime. Uh, they, would, they would often just let their horses out um, just to graze through the summer. And then at the end of the um, summer, when they went back to their, their, their towns on the, on the reservation, um, they, they gathered up as many as they could, um, and there were, but there were also some that um, uh, were not rounded up and, and likely ended up um, in and around Mesa Verde. Also in the 1930s, the uh, park con concessionaire would uh, graze some of their um, riding and, and um, packing stock on Long Mesa inside the park. And then the, the park borders, uh, Ute Mountain uh, Ute, Ute Reservation, um, and this is another source of, uh, of, of horses, and I'll talk a little bit more um, uh, about this you know, relationship with the, the tribe on two sides of the, the park. So, uh, so there, there's a lot of different sources of, of horses in, uh, in, in Mesa Verde. Um, uh, I don't know if some of those original horses are still you know, in the park, um, if some of those genes pass, pass um, through to the, the current population we have in the park. Um, but you know, there is a long history of, of horses and, and cattle in, in and around the park. Um, so as, as most of you know, in 1906, Mesa Verde was, was created. Um, this was around that time when you know, there were 2,000 you know, head of cattle that were still grazing in, in and around national, the national park. Um, likely when the park was created, there were um, a lot of animals in and around the park. Um, and then by 1932, uh, uh, the superintendent at the time, Jesse Nesbaum, um, likely realized the impacts they're having on um, either visitors or the, the resources in the park. He gave an ultimatum to exclude all livestock from Mesa Verde. And, and he actually installed the, the first fence to exclude livestock uh, from the park. Um, this was a fence that was installed near the entrance, mostly to keep livestock from, from going up the, uh, the park road. <clears throat> so some of the initial efforts to exclude livestock from the, um, from the park um, was fencing. Uh, uh, initially, brush fences were put up at the, at the canyon bottoms, mostly on the south side of the park. Um, but with the, the monsoon, rains that we, we, uh, we have every summer. Um, these, these brush fences um, really was just a short, were just a short-term solution um, and they needed constant maintenance. Uh, in the 60s, the, the, the park um, had really the first major attempt to get the uh, livestock um, out of the park. Um, and then by 1967, uh, the, the southern boundary of the park, um, which borders the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe, um, was, was completely fenced. Um, this fence was a um, barbed wire fence and a smooth wire fence. Um, and I'll talk about some of the shortcomings, shortcomings of that, that fence. Um, the, the picture you see here is a PZ, P, PVC pipe fence um, that uh, is often used across uh, repairing areas. Um, and this is a fence that's down in Mancus Canyon, or was down in, in Mancus Canyon. Um, uh, it requires a lot of maintenance um, with every heavy snow melt or um, flash flood in the, in the summer, summertime. Um, it can destroy these fences. So like I said, in the 60s, the park uh, 
really get serious about uh, trying to exclude livestock from the park. Um, over the next five decades, they had multiple attempts to remove livestock from the park. They, uh, a lot of times it was park staff that was involved with this. Um, the picture here is a, um, a capture pen on, on Moccasin Mesa. Um, they even used the, uh, the, the sewage lagoon on um, Wetherill Mesa one time um, to capture some, some horses. And um, it was successful, except the, the horses uh, kept uh, breaking into the, uh, the liner of the sewage lagoon. So um, that, uh, that uh, operation was short lived. Um, in the 1990s, uh, the state of Colorado hired some cowboys um, to remove about 62 horses um, from the park. Um, they were relatively successful in, in removing um, a lot of them, but uh, there was a little bit of a controversy. Um, I, I talked to one of these um, cowboys um, several years ago, um, and there were some high profile events where um, there was some um, roping of some horses on a road. And uh, also there was an incident where there was a, there was a horse that um, um, died from, from trying to be roped in the, in the campground. Um, also from, from uh, the information I've received, uh, there was a period of time um, before 2010 uh, where there were some tribal members that came into the park to capture and, and remove some of the livestock. So this, um, so the next, the next slide is I'm going to be talking about is, is what I'm calling the latest era of, uh, of livestock um, management. Um, and and this, is, this is when I, I came to the park. Um, I came to the park in 2010 as a wildlife biologist. And when I got here, there were approximately 140 horses in the park and about 20 cattle um, in the park. And, it, and this may have been um, kind of a high watermark for the population in the park. Um, just based on the information that I, that I know about um, estimates of populations inside the park. And, and I think this is a result of the uh, two large scale fires that occurred in the park in 2000 and 2002. Yeah, the Bircher fire and the uh, Long Mesa fire um, burns over half the, the park. Um, and for some people, you know, it's, it's kind, of, kind of tragic when you lose that many trees. But uh, if you ask any ungulates, uh, if you ask elk, deer, or even these horses, um, it basically created a, uh, a candy store for them. Um, it, as you can see from this picture, um, the, the, uh, the grass that's growing up amongst these um, trees um, is, is pretty prolific and it uh, really increased the, um, the amount of forage that's available for the horses, um, but, but also it provided a little bit more safety for them. Horses are a fight or flight animal, so um, if they can see farther, they're going to they're gonna feel um, more comfortable. There's gonna be less predation. So the, uh, um, the, uh, the recruitment and, the, and the, uh, the, the young are gonna survive a little bit better. So since 2010, we have been, we have been doing some surveys. Um, the, the numbers you see in 2011, um, the, the 100 horses, you know, that was likely 120 or 140. Um, these are just horses that we observed while we were um, doing these surveys. Um, um, as you can see, the population kind of kind of went down um, for about four or five years, and it has kind of plateaued. Um, the, I think the main reason why the population kind of decreased here is the uh, the effort that the park was um, making with installing a new kind of fence, and I'll I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, the last survey we have here is a 60 animals. Um, I think beginning of last year, we probably had maybe 70 or, or 80 animals in the park. Um, and I'll talk about some of our uh, capture um, efforts this, this last year. Um, so that number is probably right now, um, probably close to 60, 60 animals, give or take uh, five, or five or 10. So, uh, the challenge, challenges that I um, saw with trying to exclude livestock out, outside um, to keep, keep them out of the park um, or, or challenges that the park has, has had since its exception, um, inception. Um, one is the, just the porous boundary fence. Uh, I talked about the smooth and barbed wire fence 
um, that um, you know, was, was initially stalled in the, in the 60s. Um, it, was, it, it was continued, it continued to be installed um, um, and maintained up to 20, 2010. Um, but, but the problem is we, we have a fairly robust um, resident elk population. Um, and if anyone knows about elk and fences, that elk can be really hard on fences. Um, you know, they, they can jump over um, a, a barbed or smooth wire fence, um, but if they, if they hit it, they're gonna, they're gonna break it. Something else that we lack in the park um, are, are range riders, or range riders or, or cowboys um, that, are, that are out there, you know, inspecting the fence on a, on a continuous basis. Um, they're looking for, for livestock. Um, and even though the, the park has had multiple efforts to try to um, exclude um, livestock from the, from the park, um, a lot of people have spent a lot of time on, on, on fence maintenance, fence repair. Um, it's, it's not a full-time job in the park. Um, there might be a period of, of you know, several years or a decade where uh, the park is pretty religious about maintaining that fence. Um, but then if you, if you don't have that staff for a few years, um, it just takes an elk to bust the fence. And, um, and then you, you, know, you, you basically open up a floodgate for um, livestock to come inside the park. Also, we have really rugged terrain inside the park, especially on the southern boundary. And this is where you know, we have a lot of livestock coming, coming and going, um, at least in the, in, in the past. Um, and another challenge, and this is a challenge that um, the Ute Mountain um, Ute Tribe is, um, also faces is, is, um, is just the, uh, um, um, the, the rugged terrain right there. It's really hard for the park to maintain fences. It's hard to, uh, um, um, for, the, for the tribe to maintain those fences. Uh, one, one of the persons in the audience is David Stoner. He's the natural resource manager with the, um, with the tribe. And we've been um, kind of working closely with him to you know, try to figure out you know, how we can um, uh, get some of the livestock out of the fence and just kind of work together. Um, because it is a mutual um, problem. Um, if, uh, if, if we decide to have you know, horses and cattle inside the park, that would then create a source population that, 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 that could then move on to the, the tribe and become an issue, you know, issue with them and, and, and likewise. So, um, you know, the park has a long history of collaborating with the, with the tribe, um, but it's, it's a challenge for, for both of us. So why should the, the public care if there's livestock um, in, in the park? I know there's a lot of people that think we, sh we should have um, livestock in the park. Um, there's even been park uh, management staff that have thought in the past that we should we should have livestock in the in the past. Um, so there are there are some national parks that um, you know have you know, multiple um, objectives in managing their their park. Um, there's some nat national parks or national park units or national recreation areas. Um, there's there's some that um, you know protects maybe a single resource or um, you know, multiple resources. Mace Severity was, was created to, uh, to protect the cultural resources um, inside the you know, park. That's, that's our enabling legislation that um, really helps us focus on you know, why we need to, um, why we manage the, the park. Um, so that management objective, um, has been conflicting with, with livestock in the park. Um, and I'm gonna pick on horses a little bit here, um, just because of the nature of horses. Uh, horses are a, a fight or flight animal. Um, they, they wanna be able to see a long distance. Um, they, 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 they don't like to be in really tight canyons. So the horses in, in the park, um, in, in other areas um, throughout the West, you know, they're gonna be on uh, mesa tops, they're gonna be on wide uh, uh, valley bottoms. Um, and coincidentally in Mesa Verde, those are also the best um, places to grow crops. Um, so as a result, you know, the ancestral Puebloans, you know, they, they were gonna, they're, they're living in these areas um, that are ideal for, for growing crops. Um, and this is where the horses like to hang out also. So the picture you're seeing here um, is, is just below the, uh, the Farview Lodge. Um, in the center of the picture, 
um, as a collapsed tower. And off to the left here um, is, a, is a collapsed um, uh, kiva. So um, there's, there's many, many concerns and impacts we've documented from their presence. Um, this is a picture on uh, uh, Moccasin Mesa, and you can see sites kind of scattered throughout here. Um, the horses often trail through these areas and, and create uh, impacts. Um, like I said, the, the horses really like these wide, wide valley bottoms. Uh, this is a picture of Moorfield Spring. Um, and off to the left here is, is Moorfield Valley, um, Moorfield Canyon. Um, this area probably has some of the highest density, densities of cultural sites in the, in the park. Um, the area is just, just um, covered with, with cultural sites. And this spring um, is, is a, a significant uh, you know, spring, and it was probably a significant spring for the um, ancestral Puebloans that, that lived here. Um, you know, there was, throughout this whole area, you can't walk more than several, um, several feet, you know, without looking down and, and finding uh, pottery shards. So as, as a result, the, the horses just, they love this area. Um, ever since I've worked in the park, um, nine out of 10 times that you, you come here, um, the horses are in this um, uh, vicinity um, and they often come, come running. Um, you can see all the trailing um, going through this area. Um, likely before livestock came into this area, um, there, were, there, were, there was probably a lot of um, uh, cultural artifacts in this area. Um, but you know, over time, uh, you take a thousand pound horse and you, you put it on top of uh, cultural sites like this, um, and you can see the shards here. Um, and, and they're going to, um, they're just going to obliterate these, um, these sites. So uh, other than like the, the, the direct impacts of, of impacting these sites, um, we're also seeing some of the indirect um, um, impacts. So this is an area, again, um, kind of close to that first picture where the horses were, were on the rebel mounds and in the collapsed kiva. Um, this is an area that uh, they, they've, um, they've eaten all the vegetation, they've kind of trampled the, the soils. And it's really difficult to um, see this, but this is actually kind of sloped down into, into Soda Canyon. Um, you, you can't really see a lot of artifacts there. Um, so one would think, well, they're just kind of protected from all the dirt. Um, but if, if you know anything about you know, the ancestral Puebloans um, uh, cultural sites, you know, they often have trash mittens um, in, in front of uh, their, uh, their dwellings. So the area in front here in the middle um, probably was where they, you know, threw a lot of their, uh, their, their trash mitten. Um, so as a result of the lack of vegetation and the soil erosion, um, even though right now, you know, it doesn't seem like they're impacting it, um, and this is the case throughout the park, um, continued erosion just continues to expose more artifacts and just slowly kind of eats away at um, the, uh, the cultural site below here. So the, the horses and, and cows have also affected the, the natural resources in the park. Um, I'll talk about this fence in a, in a little bit, um, but to the right um, is, is Ute Mountain Ute Tribe um, and to the left is, uh, is, is Mesa Verde National Park. Um, this fence was put up, um, or this picture was taken uh, about a year after um, this fence was put up. Um, we got fairly lucky um, when we put this fence up. The, uh, the horses in the area happened to be on the, on the, right, the right side. Um, so we excluded the horses in, in this area. Um, and the only reason they're in this area is on the, on the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe. Um, this is on White's Mesa. There's a, there's a water tank there that provides a water source. So um, on the left side, there isn't a water source and that's why we don't see the impacts of, of grazing there. Um, I apologize for the, the uh, blurry picture, but this is another uh, impact from, uh, from livestock. Um, when, they, when they create the, uh, the bare soil, um, it just it, it invites invasive species to come in. Um, and this is this is a, a pile of um, 
horse dung that that's just covered with a uh, with, with cheat grass. <laughs> um, I won't. Uh, I, I, I promise not to just talk about horses. <laughs> um, I, I also want to talk about the impacts that the cattle have in, in the park. Um, we do still have about 20 cattle in some of our um, um, canyons inside the park. Uh, this picture was taken in, in Rock Canyon last um, uh, fall. Um, it, if you're from this area or if you're from the, the Four Corners area, you, you remember we had a really strong monsoon um, season. Um, with a with a huge amount of green up, and this area should be just covered with with, with vegetation. Um, but because of the, the cattle are are down in this this area, um, they've just they've just denuded the vegetation. Um, and this is what this area looks like almost every year, just because the native vegetation and, and even weeds just don't have an opportunity to come back. Um, Something that we were we were curious about um, as far as these horses hanging out around um, springs, and again, this is Moorfield Spring. Um, we were we were interested to see how they're interacting with um, other other wildlife. Um, this is a spring that we've seen a lot of elk at. And in the the upper left corner here, you can see the horses gather around the spring, and then a cow elk um, kind of right right next to them. And we set up a, a motion detect, detecting camera there, um, took thousands of photos. And, and what we found out was um, uh, these horses are, are excluding elk from this, um, from this water source. And in fact, um, in 42 out of 50, 51 encounters that we captured on um, the cameras, um, the, the horses were excluding elk from the, from the spring. Um, and this is really significant because you know, water is, is scarce inside the park. Uh, the next nearest water source is three miles away. Um, elk are a little bit more mobile and transient than, than horses. They will jump, jump fences, but um, I think this just is um, kind of an indication of how, how important this water source is to, uh, to, to wildlife in the park. Um, Another species that um, we have been concerned about in the past, um, Mesa Verde used to have a population of bighorn sheep. Um, this is a bighorn ram that, um, um, that uh, was last seen in uh, Cliff Canyon in uh, 2009, and it, um, it, it eventually, eventually died. It, there were as many as 60 or 70 big, bighorn sheep in the, in the, can, in the, in the park. Um, and on Southern U, or actually, I mean the Ute Mountain Reservation. Um, it has been shown that horses um, can exclude um, bighorn sheep also from, from water sources. Um, so it's a, it, it's a concern if we, if we do try to uh, reintroduce bighorn sheep to the park that you know, there, there could be a, a conflict with that species. So kind of moving on to uh, livestock and um, the, the human environment inside the park. Um, we used to have a lot of horses that, ha that hung out at, uh, at Farview, um, the Farview Lodge. These are some horses that are hanging out uh, near an ice making machine. Um, Aramark, our concessionaire, used to have these um, ice making machine um, sheds kind of a little ways from the, uh, from the lodge. Um, horses are pretty resourceful. They, they found out that they can lick some of the condensation from, uh, from the ice making machines. Uh, there's a drain hose in the back where water puddles up. Um, and there was at least one horse that figured out that if they just um, push their nose against the uh, ice um, making dispenser, they can, they can get ice out. Um, there was even a horse this, this last year um, on, on Weathero Mesa that uh, um, um, was able to get into a bathroom out there and then drink drink water out of the out of the toilet. Um, also on Weather Hill Mesa, um, if there's water collected in some of the uh, uh, some of the water fountains, they'll uh, they'll drink water water out there. Um, we have a lot of horses that do like to hang out um, along the road. Um, you know, fortunately, we haven't had. Um, uh, any injuries with with uh, drivers, but we did have one park employee when they were driving into the park um, hit 
hit a hit a horse. Um, so um, a question that we that we get and we have been getting for a long time is you know can livestock um, stay stay in the in the park? Um, and I just want to answer I guess some of the frequently asked questions that we that we um, get. Um, one is, you know, can't the park just, just manage the livestock? Um, um, and, and the first answer is, um, you know, those impacts that I just um, showed you um, really um, contradict, you know, why the park was created. It was, to cre it was created to protect the cultural, cultural resources. Um, in 1916, with the, um, the Park Services Organic Act, um, that the responsibility expanded to um, protect um, natural resources also. Um, also, the, life, the, the livestock is not part of the enabling legislation. Um, like, like I mentioned, um, it, it, the park was created to protect cultural, cultural resources um, and live, livestock is not part of other laws. Um, so the Park Service um, is, is guided by the, uh, the CFR Code of Federal Register um, specifically 36 CFR 2.60, which um, describes you know, when parks can have livestock. Um, and this, this includes for um, mounted, mounted uh, ranger patrol um, or con concessionaires. Um, and there's, it would be, it'd be arbitrary and capricious for, for, for Mesa Verde to say, um, you know, we, we, we wanna have livestock, um, you know, just because we, we wanna have livestock. Um, it just we just don't have the ability to uh, to make that decision. It would take a, a, an act of Congress um, and, and probably change the enabling legislation, um, which is which is not possible. Um, also, another question um, we have is, you know, why aren't they protected by the 1971 Wild and Free Roaming Horses and Burrow Act? Um, and, and this act is is only for the U.S. Forest Service and BLM. Um, and specifically for herd management areas um, on that, on those land units. Um, another comment we've, we've had is, you know, can't the park fence out all archaeological sites in the park to keep livestock out? Um, and the answer is simple. Um, we have 4,500 cultural sites in the, in the park, and it, it would really be um, not feasible to, to do that. Um, another question we get is, you know, well, can't the park use you know, contraception or um, PZP, um, which stands for porcine zona pellucida, um, to, to, con to control population growth of horses. And PZP um, um, has been used successfully in some areas on, on forest service and, and BLM land. Um, but to do this, um, we would be basically be managing the, uh, the, the population. Um, another question is, well, aren't these livestock part of the historical ranching context of the park and descendants of Spanish explorers? Um, again, we have to go back to the uh, um, enabling legislation um, um, of, of why the park was created. Um, it was decided back then, even though there was a ranching um, community um, in the area, um, that was not the reason why the park was created. Um, and it is possible that some of these horses are descendants of, 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 of Spanish um, explorers, but um, as I've demonstrated, they're, they're probably descendants of a, a lot of different animals um, in the area. So uh, lastly, uh, what is the park, park Service currently doing about livestock um, in the park? Um, I, I mentioned, uh, mentioned fences. Um, the, I mentioned about the uh, the challenge of not having like a, a range um, rider out there, or someone from the park that can go out there on a continuous basis to make sure that the uh, the, the fences are in are in good condition. So um, about a dozen years ago, we uh, designed a, a new new fence um, design, um, and this this fence uses. Um, high tensile fixed knot woven wire. Um, it's about 48 inches high. Um, it, it, was a, it was a wire that I learned about from a biologist at Mount Rushmore that uh, said that this, 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 someone drove a vehicle into this type of fence 100 feet and um, they drove back 
backwards and the fence just kind of went back to its original state. Um, it's really springy. So we needed a fence that uh, an elk could jump over and, and um, not damage it. And I, I've seen areas on this fence where the top of the fence is bent over a little bit and there's some elk hair on the top. And the elk probably jumped on it, did a belly flop on it, but the fence just, just sprung, sprung back. Um, so that was our, our main focus in, in coming up with this fence. We need something that has low, low maintenance. Um, and it has been extremely effective. Um, this, is, this is the fence on, on White's Mesa. Um, it has a H brace, like, like you see here in the center, every 200 feet. So um, native wildlife can, can jump over it. And the fence is raised up 18 inches so young animals can go underneath it. We were concerned that uh, elk may not be able to go across these fences, especially the, the larger bulls. Um, but uh, setting up a remote camera, you know, we, we had several um, pictures of, uh, of full-size elk um, easily crossing this, this fence line. Um, and I, 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 I inspected this fence last year um, after it being installed for 10 years, um, and it was still 100% effective. There's been no maintenance done on this, this fence in, a, in 100 years. Um, and going back to this, this photo, um, you can see how effective it is in, in keeping uh, livestock outside of the park. <laughs> so uh, about 2013, um, the park staff um, made the decision that you know livestock was just not compatible with the uh, with, with the park's mission, um, and we started a planning process. Um, and in 2018, um, we finished an environmental assessment um, that was looking at alternatives to um, re remove livestock in the park. Um, and then in, after five years of planning and two rounds of public scoping and getting public input, um, uh, in 2019, a, uh, a FONSI was signed. A FONSI stands for a Finding of No Significant Impact. Um, this document is signed um, usually by the uh, superintendent, but in this case, it was signed by our, our regional um, director. And, and this put in motion the, um, a plan to remove uh, livestock from the park. The main part of, of this uh, environmental assessment and plan um, is the, the removal methods. And we, we came up with five removal methods. Um, I'm, I'm listing them in, in numerical order, um, and this is, this is kind of a preference by the park and the way in, in which methods we want to use first, um, but, the, but in, the, in the environmental assessment and in, in the plan, um, if, there's a, if there's one method that we think might be more appropriate for some animals in some areas of the park, um, you know, we could, we could use some of these um, uh, methods before some of these are the preferred method. Um, I, I'll talk about the baited um, pen trapping um, in, in a little bit more detail, but this is a method, method that we're using, um, um, using low stress handling. Um, National Mustang Associ Association, you know, has been integral in, in making this um, successful. Um, again, I'll, I'll talk about this in a in a little bit. <clears throat> um, another method that we have is chemical mobilization. Um, under the uh, um, supervision of our park service veterinarians, um, there, are, there are staff inside the park that are, are trained to uh, um, chemically mobilize horses. Um, that would entail you know, shooting the animal with a, with a dart gun, um, usually in close proximity to a, a trailer, so we don't have to drag the animal um, very far. Another method is um, Wrangler Roundup. This method would, would more likely be involved with uh, um, cattle, um, but it, it could be used in certain circumstances um, with horses. Another method that um, um, was approved for use um, is, is a helicopter. Um, roundup. Um, and the last one is, is lethal. 
Um, and, I, and I will say these, these last two, two methods, um, these are gonna be for, last, for a last resort. Um, if we get to the point where we use these last two, um, there's just gonna be a handful of, of courses left and we've, we've exhausted all other um, possible methods of, uh, of, of removing them. Um, and I, and I, will say, I will say that if we get to the um, last option of, of, of lethal, um, I'm gonna be looking at maybe even other options that we have not um, evalu evaluated. Um, you know, we won't automatically jump to, uh, to that decision um, lightly. So uh, I, I do want to talk about the low-stress livestock uh, removal um, because this this is this is kind of a um, I would almost say a re revolutionary method for a federal land agency to um, to, to use um, and it's it's our preferred method it's National Mustang Association's um, preferred method um, and and it works by using the, the natural livestock in instincts. Um, where um, you know you you, uh, you don't elicit a fight or flight um, response in the animals. You know you you don't force them. Um, it takes time and patience. Um, uh, it, it works, I think, well with small groups of of, of animals, um, which is what the park is 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 dealing with. Um, most of the um, groups of animals that we're going to be capturing and handling um, are going to be in family units. Um, we're not going to be putting different bands in together, um, which, which often creates conflict. Um, a lot of roundups you see with the Forest Service and BLM. Um, using helicopters are often putting animals in a holding facility um, all together, and, and that's where you see a lot of, a lot of injuries. Um, we have the ability to work with just small groups of animals. Um, and this is safer for, for horses um, and, and humans. Um, you don't have um, animals running all around you um, in less stress and, and injuries. Um, I'll, I'll talk about the Mustang uh, camp in a little bit, but uh, some of the horses that we just captured were, were, were sent down there. And the, uh, the person who runs um, that um, training facility said it was, they were some of the calmest animals that um, she, has, she has seen. Um, and it's also been successful at uh, Theodore Roosevelt in, in Big Bend um, National Park. Um, one of the persons that we have um, uh, paid to come in to help train staff um, and also that just help handling the animals is, uh, is Whit Hibbert. Um, he's a rancher up in Montana. Uh, he worked as a, as a seasonal ranger with Theodore Roosevelt um, and Big Bend's National Parks. And he's, he's used these um, low stress methods um, in, in, in those areas. So uh, the way it, way it works, kind of in a nutshell, is um, you, uh, th this is in Moorfield Canyon. This is a, a group of animals that we, we captured this past year. Um, you habituate the animals to an area. Um, we were bringing water in um, and, and feed to the animals. Um, um, off to the right here, you can see our, our technician, Crystal. Um, the horses became very habituated to her. In fact, you can see a horse there. Um, 15 yards, yards, yards away. Um, so the, the idea is to just get the horses calm, calm around you. Um, and this pen, um, it looks, it looks big and it, it is, but it was, it was created slowly just so the horses, you know, um, just didn't show up and all of a sudden this, this huge facility was there. It was, it was created slowly over time. So when it was time to actually capture them, it was, it was, it was very, fairly quick and very calm. Um, off to the left here, there's a gate um, that's spring loaded and there's a, a remote um, release mechanism on there. So when we lure, we lure these animals in and when, the, when everything was set up, um, we had staff, veterinarians um, uh, on, um, on standby and ready to go. Um, we were able to close this door remotely from a, from a hillside and, and capture these animals. So the low stress technique um, with this operation um, uh, kind of starts here. It, it habituates, habituates the, you know, the horses to the, uh, um, to the, to the project staff. Um, when they load up onto a trailer, you use the same slow 
um, methodical technique and, and not really pushing the animals um, anywhere. Um, once the animals are loaded up in the trailer, um, we have a holding facility located in the, in the park. Um, this is, this is from the, the operation where we, we, we uh, capture those horses in that last picture. Um, off to the right here, you can see the, the majority of the horses um, over there. They were brought one at a time by the gentleman in the center, Whit, um, um, Whit Hibbert. Um, once they got into this area, they were, they were put in into this, um, this, this um, holding um, chute. It's a, um, it's, a, it's a squeeze chute. And we needed to do this to uh, take, take some blood, to, uh, to do a, do a health, health check. Um, this, this squeeze chute isn't, isn't ideal. Um, with the foresters and BLM horse operations, um, they have like a $35,000, $40,000 squeeze chute that's able to really physically immobilize the, the horses. Um, we couldn't really invest that money into um, a, a, a squeeze chute like that. So we modified this, um, basically a rodeo chute. We put some extra padding in there. Um, we put some extra doors over here. Um, we're very calm during the, the whole operation. Um, we, we would like to modify this, this pen a, a, a little bit um, more just so animals can't, can't be um, moving around. We had a couple of animals that turned 180 degrees in these pens and um, fortunately we had no injuries to horses or, or people. And we wanna continue that, um, that record. Um, but we, we do with, with the, the current um, set up here, you know, the, the park, park staff do have to get some of their hands, hands in there to grab, grab ropes. And it's, um, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're hoping to modify this to, uh, make it a little bit safer for, for everybody. Um, so let me just go back. Yeah. So once these, these animals were, um, were, were processed, um, they were they were trailered and um, they were put onto a trailer and they were moved to a couple different locations. Um, do you want to say in 2021 we, we had one horse that um, was hanging out by our campground um, near the road? Um, so we took we took the opportunity to use this low stress method and capture this horse. This was the first horse that we we actually captured um, under the, uh, the the livestock removal plan. Uh, last year, um, we did capture 19 more horses from, from Moorfield Canyon. Um, those are the horses that, that you just saw. Um, we're, we're working with the National Mustang Association um, to find homes for these, for these animals. Um, our, our preferred um, um, disposal method, if, if you will, um, is, is to get them adopted out to, to, to good homes. Um, the Park Service, um, Unlike the, the BLM and the Forest Service that you know have contracts um, with uh, with farms, you know, in the Midwest and the East, where you know they're paying indefinitely for these horses to live out their life, um, which they're required to do. We we don't we don't have that type of um, uh, agreement or, or program. So if it wasn't for the National Mustang Association, um, our only recourse would actually be to bring these horses to. Um, to, to the sale barn um, in, in, in Cortez. And, and then I, I don't know what the final destination would be of those horses. So um, um, just wanna you know, say thanks to the National Mustang or, or the National Mustang Association for their, um, their work in um, you know, finding homes for these, these, these horses. Um, so last year, 16 were moved to the, the Mustang camp um, for, um, for gentling, gentling and preparation for adoption. Um, there were three horses that um, um, were, were likely too old to be trained and adopted out. And those horses were, um, were sent to uh, a horse sanctuary in, in Nevada. Um, and this, this next year, we plan to remove um, again, approximately uh, 20 horses. Um, and, and hopefully over the next several years um, using this baited pen and, and low stress um, technique uh, will we'll remove the, the majority of the remaining horses. Um, 
again, I want to make a plug for the National Mustang Association. Um, if you if you just Google National Mustang Association, it will bring you to this um, this page, and uh, you can actually see the um, the horses that are up for uh, adoption. Um, if anyone would like a horse, if you think um, you, you might um, uh, you know, would, would want a horse, um, you know they do they do have a screening process to you know, make sure that um, you know they are going to uh, a, a good a good home. Um, I'll just briefly um, mention cattle removal. Um, like I said, we have over 20 cattle in several canyons um, and mesas along the, uh, the southern boundary. Um, we will be working with uh, the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe um, to, to uh, try to get these, these animals um, out of the park. Um, some of these canyons are areas where we are replacing fences, so uh, hopefully we can get these cattle out of the, out of the park. And, Hopefully they won't return. Um, so I, I'm really excited about this 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 project because of um, you know the, the possibility to you know restore restore the landscape of uh, of, of the park. Um, uh, they they they've been hammered, um, especially since the, uh, the the fires. You know, they're a lot of these seeps and springs and water sources have have really been denuded and, and the native wildlife has has been affected along with cultural resources so along with continuing to replace the boundary fence um which we which we realized from i realized from day one it doesn't matter if you if you remove all the livestock from the park if you have a porous fence um it's just a sisyphean um uh, event of just livestock keep keep coming back into the into the park and have the same problem. So that's definitely a high priority. Um, we're going to um, be excluding future livestock use from these water sources. Um, and, and what I mean is um, we're not gonna be excluding livestock that are currently in the park. Um, our plan is, you know, once, the, once we know there, there are, are no horses or cattle in an, in an area, um, we're gonna put a livestock um, fence around these springs um, with the purpose of if livestock do come into the park again or coming through an area, that water source is not going to be a magnet for them. The hope is that they go through there, they might smell it, they might see it, and then they'll just keep keep moving. Um, and that's that's our hope with um, a lot of these seeps and springs inside the, the park. Um, Definitely need to stabilize the, the, the soils um, in the park and, um, and then control, control weeds. And we'll be doing this by, by planting uh, native vegetation around these springs. Um, and also some of these uh, valley bottoms and, and mesas um, that have been denuded by the, the, the livestock um, grazing. So in, in summary, um, livestock has been present on the Mesa Verde Cluster for over 130 years. Um, I really feel like we're on a precipice where, you know, for the first time in 130 years, you know, the park is going to be able to, um, you know, keep livestock outside of the park um, and then really protect the cultural and natural resources in, in the park. And hopefully I've demonstrated, you know, the, the negative impacts the, the livestock are having on, on park resources. Um, Again, um, even if we wanted to, the park has no authority to keep livestock um, in the park. Um, and the park is using the most humane method for, for removal. Um, it's a priority for me um, you know, to, to use the most humane, humane method. Um, and and uh, um, it's, it's, it's a method that um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll continue for the park's um, staff to, to use. Um, and like I said, I'm, I'm really excited for the park to start healing um, the impacts from, from over 130 years of, uh, of grazing. Um, it's kind of a, this is kind of like a, um, a tombstone project for me. Um, you know, it, um, and, and I know um, Nathan Brown, our biologist, would probably feel the same, same way. There's, there's not a lot of opportunities in your career where you can make a, um, a pretty amazing difference. Um, and uh, you know, protecting protecting resources and, and, and changing the course of um, the impacts um, on those resources that that have occurred for over a hundred years.
Um, I do want to I do want to um, make some acknowledgments. And I, I just mentioned uh, Nathan Brown. He's been the park biologist for for three years. Um, he has been um, working on fence replacement. Um, he is in charge of uh, uh, capturing the horses, um, removing the horses, working with the National Mustang Mustang Association. He's um, He's a, he's 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 the park's poster child for, for this this project. Um, I also want to acknowledge Marilyn Collier. A lot of the um, history had of grazing in and around the park um, came from her um, reports and oral interviews. Um, Marilyn Marilyn worked in the park for fifty years. Um, she passed away in twenty nineteen, um, but she was she was pretty amazing. Um, and, I want to thank again National Mustang Association. Um, they've been an invaluable partner and we really couldn't do what we're doing without them. And then I had mentioned Whit Hibbard um, and also Tim McGaffick. Uh, these are two people that um, bring a lot of experience to the park and um, uh, in using the low stress uh, techniques and in, in, uh, capturing and, and handling um, the, the horses. And then lastly, I just want to thank uh, Mesa Verde Foundation for, um, you know, giving myself and the park an opportunity to uh, you know, talk about this um, important project. And I just want to leave you with uh, the National Park Service mission, which um, it's, it's good for parks, park staff to, you know, look at once in a while because it, it, it really gives meaning to what you're, what you're doing. And, um, you know, my hope is through this project that um, you know, I'll be able to you know leave the park um, um, unimpaired for the for the future generations that are going to be using the park. So with that, um, I've been talking for about an hour. Um, <laughs> well, so I, I assume really people are well. still out there. <laughs> yeah, this is wonderful. Thank you for giving all of us some insight. And um, for those who don't know, I grew up with horses. I'm an equestrian. And prior to moving out to Arizona, I used to teach equine therapy and specifically under the equus effect um, style of teaching. So the horse and I have a really strong connection. So this was really insightful, Paul, because first of all, when we think of horses or wildlife, immediately our emotions get excited because, you know, we all care and love for our wildlife and animals. And your background and all the decades you've been working for Fish and Wildlife and NPS, you're obviously um, a huge supporter of America's wildlife because this is what you do. You mitigate these situations so um, horrible means aren't necessary. And low stress removal, I commend you and Casey Cook Collins, the superintendent, for doing this at the park. Um, because hasn't this been 12 years in the making to find and work on a solution that will be low stress removal and have less impact on the actual horses and the cattle as well? Absolutely. And, and I, I must admit, it was a little stressful and nerve wracking the first few years and, until we met um, the National Mustang Association and learned about the low stress um, method um, because we did not we didn't have a lot of um, tools in our toolbox. Um, we we assumed that the horses were just going to go to the sale barn um, and a lot of horses that go to the sale barn that you know are, are not sold um, uh, you know can end up at a, a slaughter in Mexico or, or Canada. Mm -hmm. And also many thanks to uh, the Mustang Association in Colorado for um, their help and you guys at the park getting their involvement as well. We have lots of comments and questions, so why don't we just okay. get into it? So this one is from Cheryl. Um, Arizona does have herds that are descended from Spanish horses. Has anyone ever examined these horses to determine whether or not they meet Spanish horse criteria? That's kind of out of uh, my expertise. <laughs> yes. I, I do not. I've worked with a BLM on, on horses in Colorado, and I, I was I worked for the BLM with a prior mountain herd, but um, that's um, that's that's kind of my my realm of of knowledge. So um, yeah, I, I I don't know about other other horses in the in the in the area. It's it's a tough question because you know 
you know, what if they are, you know, 25%, 50%, 75% descendant of, of Spanish horses, you know, what, what then? Um, do, do we then, um, you know, give them more of a status? Do, they, do we then, you know, create a park to protect them around them? It's, it's a difficult, it's a difficult question. Um, I know it's a, it's an argument that's often brought up, but, um, I haven't personally thought through, you know, what do you do with that information then? Um, um, but it's, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's an important question that, you know, um, people, people may want to have. Sure. And, uh, Sally has a question. How many horses do you need to capture, um, and remove? How many years will it take at 20 horses a year? Sure. Um, that'll all depend on the recruitment. Um, horses can, feral wild horses can um, reproduce and, and grow at 20% 20, 20 rate, um, which means in four years they could double their population. We, we haven't seen that in the park. Um, we definitely have limiting factors like, like water and, and, and predation that keep those, those numbers down. So I don't think our population is going to grow very much from natural reproduction. Um, but assuming we just have a few foals born every year and a few less every year as we capture them. Um, I think we have 60 horses in the park. We captured 20 this year, 20 in the next couple of years, you know, hopefully in three years, um, you know, we'll be close, close to zero. All right. And this is a follow-up question from Sally again. Will elk, deer, and other animals still be able to get to these fenced water sources? Yes, they'll, they'll have access to the, the water. We're, tr we're still trying, trying to develop a, a restoration plan for the, uh, these springs. Um, some of these springs only flow maybe a, a few feet. Some of them will flow 30 or 40 um, yards. Um, the hope is that we can you know, um, ensure that there is an, an adjacent water source if we're gonna fence the whole area off to let the vegetation patient grow. Um, if we if we if we can't provide another if we don't if we know there's not another alternative water source in the area and we can't provide you know additional water flowing out of the spring um, we'll have we'll have a fence maybe similar to the boundary fence where um, young animals can go under the fence and then the larger animals can hop over the age braces. Okay, well, well, thank you, Paul. This is a question from Tracy Coppola. How can park advocates help support this work? Are there any appropriate stewardship volunteer projects for public participation with Mesa Verde National Park staff and Ute Mountain Ute Tribal Park staff? I would say right now, probably the best thing you could do is, um, um, we, we're, not, we're currently not using volunteers. Um, you know, I would say get the word out that there, there are horses that, that need to be adopted. You know, contact the National Mustang Association. Um, uh, if you, the best thing you could do is, is just adopt a horse <laughs> or two. <laughs> That's probably the best thing you, you, you know, you, you can do. Um, but, um, but yeah, right now there isn't, there isn't a need. Um, definitely the National Mustang Association, you know, needs some donations, you know, to care for the horses. Um, they're hoping to recoup, recoup some of their cost from a, an adoption fee. Um, but I, I do want to add that, you know, the, the, the success of the park removing horses um, depends on the success of the National Mustang Association adopting horses out. Um, we can't just give them 60 horses and say, you know, here you go. They, they have to take them in small batches. They have to work on finding, finding um, people to adopt the, the, the horses. Mm -hmm. And so much goes into that. I mean, there's a lot of um, monitoring the horse, the behavior, everything, and some slight training since these are feral wild horses. So that's months in the care of the, the Mustang Association. Absolutely. Yeah. And I know Linda Larson's on here, so she might be <laughs> a better person to really give NMA a plug and, and how people can you know, directly be involved with the adoption process. great but that's but that's wonderful tracy that you, you want to somehow volunteer and i'm sure the park does have other volunteer opportunities um if not with the horses with something else this is a question from jay 
what is the timeline or the plan for replanting native vegetation? We may do it as, as early as this year. Um, that Moorfields spring area, um, we may have horses out of that area this, this year. Um, and to, to start recovering it, you know, we may just plant some seed there just to, just to um, stabilize the, the soil. Um, we'll try to get a fence up there um, as, as, soon as, as soon as possible. Um, restoration is expensive, so likely we will be applying for, for funds with the National Park Service um, to, to, to get some restoration funds. Sure, we have a comment from David Stoner. Thank you, Paul, for the wonderful presentation. We will stay in touch. The tribe plans to get the cattle out of the park as soon as we can. Um, we have Thanks, David. great comments from Casey, uh, Linda. Just wanted to thank and commend the park for choosing to use the low stress, humane and ethical method to capture the horses. And um, uh, here's a question from Linda Larson. Uh, will DNA testing, uh, oh, I'm sorry, forgive me. We DNA tested the first stallion removed from the park and he was 23% Spanish Iberian. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Linda. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and here's a, a follow up from Tracy uh, Coppola. Thank you. Between I'm with the National Parks Conservation Association. So if there are any policy advocacy needs to, I'm here. We appreciate you all. So how wonderful that we have so many people coming out. I saw a few university people in the comments as well and for everyone's interested in, in this. It was also fascinating for me to see when you think of um, Mesa Verde and the size of the park in its entirety, you think about, well, how much damage could a hundred horses actually do to the park? And the photos were so enlightening because it's like, wow, that's some serious damage. You see it around the spring area, just the native vegetation as someone had mentioned in the comments and also to the cultural sites. And what else happens to the cultural sites, Paul? Um, you had made mention that it kind of erodes further down or it exposes new sites. <clears throat> It, it, yes, yeah. Um, I mean, we haven't quantified that, but um, you know, if you're looking at a steep, steep slope and there's horses on there, um, every time you know a raindrop falls on there, um, or a, you know a monsoon um, rain event, you know you're you're gonna lose lose soil on there and, and ex expose um, more um, either architecture from structures um, or just um, scatters from uh, the cultural sites. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Paul, for, for your work. And I'll just give it another minute or so if there's any other questions or comments you want to ask Paul or leave for us, please go ahead. Otherwise, in the next uh, minute, we're going to just pass it over to Shannon to conclude the webinar. And also, it looks like Shannon has dropped Paul's NPS email in the chat box if you want to directly reach out to him. Um, please go ahead. Yeah, feel, feel free to like ask me anything. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't mind. Be I don't, careful I don't with mind that what one. your position is. And I, I love discussions. So. Yeah. Oh, and here's <laughs> Tara be, Travis. She says, thank I, you, Paul. And I, yeah, and I, and I, you know, horses, you know, eating some calorie, it's kind of a hot, hot button topic. Um, you know, and I, tr I try to, I try not to be defensive, you know, with, with what the park is trying to do. I, you know, I, I try to, you know, empathize with people to, you know, gain an understanding of, of their views because I've, I've learned a lot from um, uh, the, the horse advocates and other stakeholders um, through this, through this whole process. Well, if anything, I think the model that you all are doing at the park with this situation is something that in years time, I'm sure other places are gonna implement as well. I, I hope so. Yeah, yes. on that note, Shannon, do you wanna conclude the webinar? Yes, I would love to. Thank you all again for joining us today. Um, if you'd like to learn more, as Monica said, I have dropped um, Paul's email into the chat box. I also just uploaded 
or just dropped actually our website address into that chat box as well. Um, if you would like to help, uh, the Mesa Verde Foundation is actually raising money to support the, the retrofitting of the chute for the horses to add additional padding so that the horses won't be able to move around um, just for their safety. And then also we'll be contributing to um, fencing and, and restoration needs as well. So if you'd like to make a donation, feel free to visit our website at www.mesaverdefoundation.org. Um, we do love our park staff. So thanks very much to everyone who joined us today. We love our supporters. We love our presenters. Thanks, Paul. And of course, we love Monica, who's always so graciously moderating our webinars. Um, thank you all um, very, very much uh, for joining us on your Valentine's Day. And we hope that you have the most amazing Valentine's evening as we sign off here today. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, Monica. Thank you.